Welcome back, everybody. And our topic now is that actually uh, our virtual developers conference is completely running on uh, virtual machines provided by Microsoft Azure. And um, Shevin, maybe you, you give us a, a quick overview about what's your connection in regards to, to Microsoft Azure in, uh, since the past, currently, and, and bits and pieces. Yeah, so for those who don't know, I'm actually Microsoft uh, Azure MVP. And uh, we are only two MVPs in Mauritius, like me and Jackie, and uh, I've been focusing on uh, Azure in the past years, and that's like my expertise in in the MVP community. And yeah, I've been playing, starting to use Azure, I think it was back in around 2013, right? 2013, 2014, or I still remember back then we had only three or four services, like virtual machines, um, SQL was there. And since then, the platform has been growing and continue, continue to grow to where it is now. And even in terms of regions, they've been scaling, adding more and more regions. And we still we also have one in uh, Africa right now. Yeah, uh, recently, actually, there are two that are um, associated to the um, Africa region. On the one side, I think since last year, December, we have the one in uh, that is classified as South Africa North. Um, there are two, because Azure is always about um, having a, a region split over two data centers. If I'm not wrong, there is one located in in around uh, in or around Johannesburg, and the second data center. Um, don't nail me on that. I think it's in Cape Town. And the second region for for Africa is actually um, north of us. It is um, with two data centers, uh, one in Abu Dhabi, and I think the other one in Dubai. And um, I th I'm hoping that there might be coming some more infrastructure in regards to that. And I think this is also uh, an interesting aspect to see that um, the African continent, the region here, Indian Ocean, um, is under the radar and the development by the big names of cloud computing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know the ones in UAE were live. Checking those at the moment, I need to test test those soon. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> um, say, uh, I mean, um, we are using for, for our virtual machines here for the DevCon. We are actually using um, because of the type of um, virtual machines that we need for the broadcasts. Mm -hmm. um, we are actually running in, I think, East US uh, because the so-called uh, N-series uh, machines are not um, available in, in, the, in the data centers here in, in South Africa or in, in um, in Dubai, so it was it was actually a little bit of a challenge that um, you need to know which resources are accessible and available in which regions in order then to see how you can um, yeah allocate your resources. Mm -hmm. um, whereas on the other side, we are also um, uh, doing some tests by running an MSCC uh, website. Um, at the data center here in Johannesburg, or in the in the South Africa North region, as it is officially called, and it's amazing because wow. the uh, the the response times on the ping, the latency. Um, you know, if you would say you go, you go Europe or you go um, Southeast Asia, you might have to calculate about. 280, 330, 400 milliseconds, whereas in uh, South Africa, uh, South Africa North, mm -hmm. have, a, have a guess. What's the latency? How many milliseconds? Around about 60? 
Yeah, exactly. You, <laughs> you're targeting, you targeting definitely below 100 millisecond. So yeah. when I did my measurements, I was bouncing between 65 and 80 milliseconds. And I mean, this is four times the res up to five times better response times. And I mean, this clearly gives you definitely better responsiveness on, on your sites, especially then uh, if you're working with, with API services and middleware, that mm -hmm. you are closer um, to your customers. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a big uh, win for everybody who is running on Azure round about Africa and Mauritius. Yeah. So tell us well, a bit about, yeah, about <laughs> what The uh, drawback what is you... that you pay more. No, the drawback is that you pay more. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you need to trade. Either you want to have latency performance or you have cost. I mean, uh, it was a little bit surprising to, to notice that, um, especially here in Africa, that it is a, a let's say, low, low income um, situation that we are kind of asked uh, to pay the higher price compared to Europe or North America or you know, Japan or something. And the difference can make up to, you know, 30, 40, 50 dollar for an um, for an app service per month, depending on which mm -hmm. tier you are driving. So it was kind of surprising, but okay. With more customers, hopefully there's going to be a reduction in, in, in the price layers. Yeah, and that's the yes. trick about when we are using the cloud, right? We need to know what, when and where we are deploying. It all depends on what we need, what kind of performance we need, some kind of tools you don't expect, like mm, fast response, like you can run it in batch. You would do these stuffs like in like maybe on cheaper tires or in cheaper regions, whereas things that you expect like first response time, you would definitely uh, pay a bit a bit more expensive. But I definitely believe that if uh, like Maybe with scaling, this would help to reduce the cost down, bringing more people on board. That mm -hmm. that could help. Yeah. Well, on the other side, uh, with the Google Cloud Platform, right now there are no um, actual data centers in in our region. So I had a look on the location platform. No physical data centers. Um, the only thing is what you what you would get at the moment on the Google Cloud Platform here in, in um, the African area are their uh, so-called edge points, uh, which means that you have um, Google infrastructure, Google servers that are uh, providing you um, a nearer entry point into the Google network with um, caching facilities, but it's not the situation that you could actually then um, host and operate and run uh, your apps or your functions or you know your Kubernetes cluster um, in a physically located data center at the moment on the African continent. I hope this is going to change soon seeing that actually Microsoft as well as uh, Amazon uh, is already um, on the market here. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. Let's let's talk about some services. And I would say we start with the um, with the simplest one, compute uh, options. Jevin, what are what are the, the um, slide overview? What are the options that you can have on Azure in regards to um, computing facility um, infrastructure. Yeah, obviously we start by like the most uh, basic ones. There's like the the virtual machines, well, what, which which are there. Even in this space, we have like different uh, tires of virtual machines. I don't remember all the tires, but caters for different kinds of budgets. So interesting things in virtual machines, we can also run it on like different kind of disks. There's also the, the SSD drives that, that are there that can be used in the virtual machines nowadays. And this helps like to boost the performance like where required. Also okay. seeing like connected to virtual machines is like the use of virtual machine skill sets. So the idea is like 
could be running like several virtual machines running the same workload with a like load balancer in front, in front of it. So this is really, really, really meant for high availability. And mm -hmm. VM scale sets allows you to create like like thousands of VMs in minutes to really right. give the powers of, of scalability if you want to, to go in a VM. Yeah. Well, this actually sounds very similar also what is available on the Google Cloud Platform with the Compute Engine, how they call it. Uh, it's literally like, okay, you 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 have the intention that you want to create a virtual machine because you might um, have to uh, lift and shift existing code that has, um, you know, a couple of dependencies or you might have additional libraries or, you know, f um, features that, that you need to have. You know, some even some web apps might have the the requirement for a printing spool. So, um, in in order to handle this, you actually need to put them into a virtual machine. Um, the interesting aspect, to my opinion, is with the Google Cloud Platform, is that uh, yeah, you get predefined sizes similar to Azure, um, but there's also the option that you can actually um, customize. Um, your hardware so that you can say, okay, I'm, I'm taking X amount of virtual CPUs, how they call it, V CPUs, and I want to combine it with X amount of, of RAM. And, uh, you know, you're very flexible in, in regards to that custom um, customization in regards to hardware. Um, I haven't seen this kind of um, feature in Azure, maybe I'm, I missed something, or you are, are you aware of that? Uh, not not as far as I remember. I did not see anything where like you can mm. configure your own machines to the extent that that you are saying. What I've seen okay. is like yeah, you can definitely like add things like CPUs, memory, um, things like that. Not to the ex extent that that you are saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, with Azure, my experience is that you get like predefined sizes. So, if you say, okay, you take a four core machine, it automatically comes with X amount of RAM. Even if you then say, okay, you have different types of four core machines that you can choose, but it's predefined. You, you, you cannot adjust that you say, okay, you like to have four cores and uh, a flexible amount of memory that you choose, like to say, okay. And also uh, something else as well that, I, that I'm that i not sure is about the the size of the, of the um, hard disk for the operating system. Because here as well, I think there, there might be a little bit more flexibility on the Google Cloud platform on that part. But otherwise, I mean, it's an insane what you can do on a sewer in a, in regards to the hard disks. Yeah, it's like with the SSD, the amount of scaling that you can do really helps you. And one thing I yeah. saw recently was like Azure dedicated host. I don't know if you heard okay. about this one. It's like you have a virtual machine on a physical server that is only used by your organization. It's okay. like you know that this uh, physical server, it's for your organization, it's only for you, it's not shared. You have all the, all the power and everything you're paying, it's it's just for you. So that's something awesome. like enterprises might, might mm -hmm. uh, be interested. And from a performance perspective, and even if some people are like a bit worried about from a data perspective, I believe this, this could also help. But that's different to the um, Azure stack, where you also yes, have this different. kind of... Yeah. Okay. So Azure because, stack because is, uh, is the appliance that you buy and you yeah. install in your own data center. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this that's this cool. one is the... It's physical server for you, but it's not like in your organization. It's managed by Microsoft. Okay, okay cool. Cool. Yeah, I guess it gives you a, a faster connection then with on-premise um, services and then in regards to, to cloud activities, I can understand. All right, good. What else do we have in the compute engine area that Azure is offering? Yeah, we start to go a bit with the Kubernetes stuff and uh, container, container world. 
where uh, here we have like multiple options. If uh, if you're interested, we've like Kubernetes, the the real Kubernetes stuff. We have uh, Azure Kubernetes Service, which yeah. is a managed Kubernetes environment. So you can use this one, and they're obviously like how to say that more managed services. Like for example, you have web apps containers whereby okay. there's already Azure Web Apps that's here, but it mm -hmm. adds it, the option for you to deploy a container, and then it gives you all the benefits of Azure, uh, Azure Web Apps that you would get, like how to provision your like SSL certificates and other things that are specific to Web Apps, like uh, DNS, okay. mm, like how to manage your feature flags, deployments, all this stuff. There's also so, something else that I saw so, recently. So, so uh, yes. just hang on, hang on. Uh, so actually, when you say um, your, you can run your web apps on your own container, so it's literally that you can uh, produce your own runtime environment apart from the predefined um, runtime environments that you would get on app service with this with this um, web apps containers. Is this yes? Do I understand it correctly? Yes, okay. definitely. You That's bring your cool. own containers that you build yourself and you bring it in. Um, hmm. I was looking at uh, the different sessions happening in the okay. DevCon, and I saw a lot of things happening on containers, Kubernetes, and yeah. I was looking at something that maybe I could present that's not here. And I think on, uh, when it is? It's on Friday, I'm talking on ACI. ACIs, it's like, they call it like the serverless offering for containers, whereby okay. in this case, you don't need to worry about the infrastructure stuff at all. Just bring your container and they will scale it for you and talking more about that on Friday. Yeah, mm, so that's, cool. that's a bit about the different options. Um, yeah, there's also well, Service Fabric. I've never used Service Public, but I know it's grown internally by by Microsoft. Mm. So that's I'm, I'm pretty. I'm actually I'm pretty impressed actually that um, you get the um, Azure Kubernetes Service AKS. Um, if you see about Kubernetes itself, um, it came from it came out of a development by by Google, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So uh, there we also see that actually um, there is this. Um, um, intersection, this crossing over of technologies between the different um, uh, cloud computing providers. Because, I mean, uh, if if you go from a, from a classic background that you say, okay, you go and you have your own uh, physical server or your virtual server, um, usually it's a situation that it's like, okay, you have it running on, on a Linux system or something like that. Um, whereas then, if I see, for example, in in Google Cloud in the Google Cloud platform. Um, they offer you images that you can actually fire up a Windows server. Whether it's I think 20, 2016 or twenty nineteen, that's okay. I mean, on Google Cloud Platform, you can uh, run Windows based um, infrastructure. Um, also, the latest addition that that has been done in the in the, in, in regards to Cloud SQL is actually that you can fire up an instance of um, SQL Server and and run it for for your applications that you're hosting on on um on google cloud platform so i think this is pretty amazing that you get more and more flexibility and that you're not really uh, bound or or restricted in in just using uh, a single uh, service operator Yes, and even on the Azure world, I knew that most of the virtual machines are running Linux. Exactly. And I think the last yeah. statistics was about 50% plus is all running on Linux. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, this also clearly shows that Microsoft is totally open uh, and not the Microsoft of your granddaddies anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not super happy about that. Yes, definitely. But, so okay. I've, I've heard a, a lot of good stuff about the GCP Kubernetes uh, offering. Can you tell us a bit more about, about that? 
of course, of course. It's one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the thing is that um, as far as I've, I've, I have the, the, the knowledge and the experience between um, um, Google Kubernetes Engine, um, uh, GKE, and, and the Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS, um, I... I have the impression that actually with the situation of Kubernetes coming uh, out of the ranks of Google, that um, the Kubernetes engine offered on the Google Cloud platform um, feels uh, a little bit easier to, to maintain, to orchestrate and bits and pieces. So it's it's literally you have um, in, the, in the web console, uh, you have good opportunities that you can pick up your containers, uh, that you can create your pods, that you can deploy them, that you can orchestrate them. Um, there's a dedicated um, uh, a core operating system that is available. You can trigger automatic update uh, routines on your on your nodes uh, that are that are picked up. But of course, you can also fix it to a specific version if you're experiencing uh, incompatibilities. Um, you can um, have shifted deployments like green blue deployments where you can say yeah. okay um you know you say okay uh your new development you you offloading it 20 percent um of your of your uh, development is running um on on green on on blue state uh, and then 80 percent of your of your no of your nodes and pots is, is running on on green state and so you can actually kind of handle and guarantee that you have no downtime while you are developing and deploying. And it's pretty impressive. And even then, if it comes down for the more professional uh, cloud engineer, there, of course, there are the, the command line interface tools, CLI tools, there's mm -hmm. cube control, so that you can manage literally everything that is needed in regards to um, Creating your deployments, um, configuring uh, your your um, uh, sets, um, that you take care of of the load balancing, that you have your exposure of your services. So I was actually pretty impressed, and I I have to admit I did not dig too much into the Azure functionality, but from the get going, it felt more complete and intuitive on the, on the Google Cloud platform. But perhaps you can shine a little bit more light on Kubernetes handling on Azure for me. Yeah, I've been experimenting a bit with it and it's, uh, it, do, it does have everything that, uh, that you, are, you are saying, but it's also like a bit more customized for Azure. Like what's nice is you can run all the like kubectl commands it is mm -hmm. the real Kubernetes thing running, but they have added like a layer of uh, orchestration like on top of it, which generally makes it like easier to manage and like some kinds of helper functions that will help you like to scale and to manage the different nodes in the environment. So I like that a lot. And I've been also been playing with the, using the vanilla like Kubernetes stuff. Okay. On premise, and you can't compare with the level and of uh, orchestration that you get, and uh, some of the abstractions that you get. I think it's really helpful. But you've been talking about the uh, blue-green deployment. Yes, mm -hmm. you can do that on on Ikeas, but Fantastic. you can also do it on Azure App Service. If you're going on the Ikeas route, it's a bit more like like uh, high scale, you've been you've got to be running a lot of microservices, and okay. it takes some more time to get get up and running and get up to speed with those technologies. But if you're running just an Azure App Service, there they have the concept of it, they call it deployment slots, which is okay. actually the blue green deployment. And it's very interesting that how with such a managed service you get you get this built in, like you could mm -hmm. be deploying uh, to have like slot A running in production. You deploy your new stuff on slot B, and once deployment is done, you can test it, 
and just swap swap the traffic. So you get to release your new app with new new okay. downtime. And that's can you do you have the situation that you have a hundred percent swap or that you can actually have a gradual deployment on on Azure? So you you can do gradual. You can do gradual. You can like ship some traffic on the blue slot okay. and some traffic on the green slot. Uh, test it, check the logs, and have the feedback. And once you're convinced, you can just make the swap. You can do that also. It's very interesting. And coming from yeah, a managed definitely. service, it's very helpful. Definitely. It's also interesting that, for example, if you if you say like you have um, regional features that you might be able to, you know, put some um, uh, geo mapping analysis in, in your traffic um, uh, uh, monitoring that you can actually also say, okay, people from a from a specific region via your traffic manager, they are mm -hmm. actually exposed onto onto a specific um, deployment, whereas people coming from another region are actually then rerouted into into a different um, deployment slot. Um, okay, sounds very cool. I mean, this yeah. is also possible what you can do on, on the Google Cloud Platform in regards that uh, you can work with Traffic Manager. So cool. All right, of course, now that we, that we uh, moved from um, full service virtual machines a little bit into uh, containers and Kubernetes, let's move further and reach into the area of um, Serverless, what is available on the Azure platform in regards to serverless? Yeah, so first thing that the first item that was there was the, how it's called, Azure Functions, where mm -hmm. you've, you get to run your functions as a service. And there's also, I forgot the name, the event, uh, event stuff. Okay, mm, I, I thought you might, you, you might you might consider uh, logic apps. Yes, yes. So logic okay. apps, logic apps. It's also serverless, and actually, logic mm -hmm. apps is more like monitoring like several kinds of events that might be happening, yeah. and once those events happen, decide what uh, action and logic to to be to for, to build in and mm -hmm. then have some kind of output. So an example would be like monitoring a blob storage, mm, yep. having a, an invoice that comes in the blob storage, then be able to notify someone that's like send an email that, hey, there's a new invoice that came in and it's in the blob storage. Or you might also be able to like, hey, that's, that's the new invoice that I have. Um, I want to run some analysis of it like check some items into in, onto this file. And if something happened, I want to send a notification, else I want to save it in a database. So it can do all these things like with a, a very like, how to say, low-code and drag and drop uh, kind of interface. It's also very interesting. And it also works very well with Azure Functions, whereby if you need to write some custom code logic you would then write that in Azure Functions and link those together. So Logic okay. Apps also ties in with most of the Azure ecosystem, but also ties in with external services, um, like some ERP systems, uh, email platforms, okay. um, emails, like or any kind of stuff. It's a bit like a Swiss knife of all the, the services like plugged in together. Okay, you got you got your connectors then that you that you mm -hmm. can actually uh, activate. Well, that's that sounds very very familiar. Also, what what you got on on the Google Cloud platform. Most interestingly, it's also called functions. <laughs> and um, yeah, same like you mentioned that um, you get different types of triggers, like for example, um, a storage event or also an HTTP endpoint that you get the URL that you can trigger in order to, to uh, um, start or launch a function. You might have some JSON load that you actually pass as parameter into your function and get it processed. And so it sounds very, very, very familiar and very similar. Um, 
um, what is the situation in regards to the um, runtime environments that are available on, on serverless, like on functions? What, in which languages can you write your code? Um, for example, on, on Azure Functions. Do you have an idea or can you give us that? Yeah. I, I remember, from what I remember, there was um, Nerd, C Sharp, and I think Java was to come, but I don't know if it's there yet. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't remember everything, but that's that's what I remember so far. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that sounds similar, similar, very familiar or similar to what is available on, on the Google Cloud platform. I think there's a situation that actually you get uh, starting with JavaScript. I think this was the first runtime that is available. Um, there's also then the possibility that you can uh, develop your functions in Python. Very interesting, I guess, for the data engineering part. Um, classic, because it's Google, there's the Go language that you can run your functions in. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they also offered it now that you can that you can develop them in C Sharp based on .NET Core. And again, okay. I'm super impressed wow. that you get this kind of cross-functionality of, of you know, um, features in, in the different cloud platforms. I mean, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I did not see this one coming. <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, I guess was, I think you, I, I hope that actually on, on Azure functions that there is Python, uh, maybe R and, and Go language uh, hopefully coming in the future because I mean, they are pretty much common used on, on, on middleware and, and backends, especially in the data engineering field. Yeah, exactly. So I'm checking it right now. So .NET, JavaScript and Java are there. And there's mm -hmm. also Python. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Cool. cool. But I'm kind of uh, curious, how many people using the Google Cloud platform would be developing on .NET Core? That would be an interesting thing to learn about. Indeed, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I can't give you any figures, but I mean, I personally like the idea that you can, um, especially with .NET Core, that you can you can do your development, um, you can have your automations, you can have your test runs, and you are not limited to your cloud provider. Um, that that you can say, okay, I go I go forward. That even that I'm using Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Um, you develop your stuff locally, you have your deployment um, or your online repository, and then you have the flexibility to say, okay, we can actually um, deploy this um, on Google Cloud for platform using an, uh, the, the app engine with the flexible runtime, because there you can run your, or there you get it that you can use a .NET Core container, which, mm -hmm actually uses the image that is provided by Microsoft. Yeah. And and you can run it. So there you also know exactly that you get the 100% compatibility. So you know if your .NET Core code runs on the Azure platform, on a container, or on an app service, you almost certainly know, OK, uh, it will also run on the app engine flex time, uh, flex engine than um, on on, uh, on Google Cloud Platform. And I find it super amazing that you really, you're not stuck and bound um, with one cloud computing provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting times to be, to be a developer, actually. There's all these kind of tools on the different platforms that, that you can use, and it's very nice. It's no longer like it was like 10 years back, whereby if you are using something for Google, you won't be using something else. Now we are using, we are seeing more and more like like mix and match between mm -hmm. the different tech stack. Like for example, there are many people developing on uh, Angular application on their front end, yeah. and, but having a .NET Core backend, it's, it's quite a familiar stack and it's very exciting. And you can actually deploy that on any cloud now with containers and Docker, there's nothing limiting 
ice developers in terms of technology, and that's very actually, nice. Actually, actually, you you might see that when you when when you have a look into the um, MSCC uh, repositories that we have a few websites um, for the for the MSSC that are actually um, having a front end uh, developed in Angular or in Vue.js, but they are hooking up to an API that is currently still running on .NET Framework. And mm -hmm. uh, even then I have the possibility to say, okay, uh, my, my front end um, is deployed let's say on Google Cloud Platform, but my API middleware um, is hosted, for example, on, on a virtual machine on, on Azure. So even then we get this flexibility that you can um, establish um, um, virtual networks between cloud service providers. Yes, definitely. But I, we haven't, I, I haven't explored this further, but it's possible. I have seen it and it seems to actually work pretty nicely. But personally, uh, I need to give it a go. Well, um, early on, you, you were going into the direction of storages and um, well, you were talking about blob storage. What, what are the other options that we are having um, on Azure to store yeah, wow. information? Yeah. <laughs> this one quite quite a few, right? Started Azure started typically with uh, having the um, hosted Azure SQL database and the classic storage account. So in the classic mm. storage account, you can store like your blobs. Now you have file storage. It's like where you would just store your files, just storage account, nothing fancy. And then the second service that was added, I believe, was Azure SQL, which is um, a SQL server managed by Azure, referred as a platform. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really nice. You can spin it up really fast and just have a database um, server just running like in, in a few clicks or in a few commands without much, much hurdles. So this was, I think, the first service that I saw uh, running as a platform back in 2013 or 2012, and I, I remember that I was really, really impressed by seeing, by seeing such such things uh, okay. compared to in the enterprise world back then, where people were still you know, provisioning servers, installing the OS, and doing this stuff. So that's also why I I also tell people that I grew up becoming a bit of a spoiled child because. I don't see myself doing these things in 2020. I mean, what, what, what why would someone do that? Mm. <laughs> yeah, true and, true. and they gradually added more of this Azure SQL. Like now it's also supporting SQL Server and uh, Postgres SQL. Okay. So this is also available as a service. And mm -hmm. I remember back in 2016 when I was in the in the MVP summit. Yeah, the <laughs> one you know that you could not go. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit <laughs> bound. <laughs> and back in 2016, they were about to 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 start this offering, and I've got to met, meet some of the program managers on this team, and mm -hmm. you know, like. Uh, which which direction they want to go, and they were also asking for feedback, and we met yep. the guys back then, and now these okay. are live, and uh, I think like the the main objective for these were like to get people out of the Oracle ecosystem into Azure. Probably, probably, <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to say that. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, Microsoft SQL Server is relatively new on the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, you can spin it up. I think it's still preview uh, option that you can, um, in the service called Cloud SQL, 
you have it as as a as a possible choice that you can spin up uh, a Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, and again, this is actually as far as I've analyzed it, it it is spinning up a container that is then running SQL Server on Linux. So it is actually you get uh, it seems that you get a full featured SQL Server, and and not a kind of um, product like Azure SQL. So, because, I mean, that that kind of managed, um, specialized SQL Server option, like, like it is Azure SQL, I haven't seen that in regards to SQL Server on the Google Cloud Platform. But on the other side, it is since ages that you can spin up instances for MySQL as well as for Postgres uh, easily on the Google Cloud Platform. And, um, I don't know how is how's the situation about MySQL then on uh, on on Azure. Are there possibilities? Yes, it's uh, also available as a service, right? Mm. It's on the same stack or similar stack as Azure SQL. It scales the same way. You spin up, you spin it up with the same uh, like uh, as easy as you would do with uh, Azure SQL, and it's mm. very nice. And so it. Three things like Azure SQL, MySQL, and Postgres, they are all available as a service. And, Fantastic. And they are also available. You can also spin up your virtual machines to install those, and nothing prevents okay. you to go there. Okay. But uh, now, like looking into the a bit of the future where where these are going, there's also Azure Cosmos DB, which okay. was previously called document DB, I believe. Mm -hmm. so this, uh, that's the NoSQL offering, which uh, is uh, globally distributed. And they also call it the serverless database. Okay. And it gives you like, a, for example, you can run like uh, MongoDB and like you have key value storage you have all okay. these NoSQL stuff available in as a service in Azure Cosmos DB. And the, the nice thing is you can query these things via three kinds of APIs. They call it the yep. SQL Core API, Cassandra API, or the MongoDB API. So you have your NoSQL database up and running in Azure. You're storing all your documents, all your JSONs into, into this mm -hmm. thing. But you can okay. query it with a SQL-like um, language or with okay. uh, the traditional Mongo language, if you're familiar with Mongo, or with the Cassandra API. It's like an abstraction on top of on top of this. Well, that's really, really helpful. And okay. the takeaway here is like it scales really, really fast to different regions of the world. I don't okay. remember the exact technical term, but I knew the replication between the regions is really, really fast. It mm -hmm. fastest replication on, on Azure so far. Okay. Well, but uh, as I understood, um, it is kind of that you are bound then to um, NoSQL data handling, because I think this is something um, interesting on the Google Cloud Platform, because there's a product that they call Cloud Spanner, and this gives you um, multi-regional um, relational databases. And I'm not sure whether I've seen that um, on the Azure platform, but okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, Shevin, what's the situation in regards to, to networking? Because, I mean, um, I, I was struggling on Azure uh, in regards to networking and then sub-networks and, and bits and pieces. And I was kind of, yeah, positively impressed uh, about how it is actually uh, handled on the, on the Google Cloud Platform. What's, what's your take or what's your experience with networking? Yeah, I think it uh, takes some time to get the grasp of how all these items are configured and, and work together, right? Especially mm -hmm. if you're working on the on the YAS 
on the infrastructure offering. So we do there, there is like the load balancer, virtual networks, VPN, mm. and uh, all these services are like are available. If you are setting it up from an infrastructure perspective, I I find it mm. also find it a bit difficult to get the grasp of all these technologies. Mm. For example, you, you have your VNet where you can create all your resources in it that's inside of Azure. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, of course put a uh, pretty load balance on top on top of the different like virtual networks yeah. that yeah. you're having. And on top of that, you can put now like a traffic manager in front of that if you want to to scale to different regions. Let's okay. say you have businesses in uh, in uh, Africa and in Europe, you could have two regions, and this would be routed via via traffic manager and load balanced in each region. So definitely yeah. feasible. I do believe it takes some time to to get hold of all those concepts. Mm. And uh, well, yeah, I mean, how is it in GCP? In GCP, I mean, I was kind of impressed because first of all is you need to see that um, networking in, in, in the, on the Google Cloud Platform is kind of based on logical networks you are not really bound to um, ip ranges uh, cider not notations or bits and pieces it's like uh, your account by default has a global spanning network and there you can then of course go ahead and define other networks define other sub networks but i think this was the major difference with azure where the the networks the vnets are regional bound to to the to the region where you're running and operating your infrastructure and the other thing is what i found pretty cool is that on the Google Cloud Platform, they have something that they call a uh, network tax. So you actually can tag your resources independently from where they are just by, by giving them the same tagging and they can communicate with each other. You can, wow. def you can define firewall rules based on a network tag and those firewall rules, uh, firewall rules are then applied um, to um, the resources that are owning the same network tag. And tagging so far on Azure, to my understanding, was limited to uh, billing and, and financial development. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> so that was it's kind of shocking. Used to, yeah, it's only used to be able to recognize um, like which resource belong to which people, that's it. Okay, okay. I'm getting here the five minute signal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, there, there are so much more services. I mean, we, we are right, literally only um, uh, scratched a little bit on the, on the computing engine or compute uh, area. We scratched a little bit on the storage options. I mean, now we just talked a little bit about um, uh, networking. Um, Friends out there in the audience, check it out. There is uh, cognitive services. There is uh, big data handling that is available on Azure, uh, on, on Google Cloud Platform. Um, there are um, monitoring services, locking. Um, it's just amazing. I mean, um, alone on the Google Cloud Platform, you get almost 200 different services and bits and pieces. And I guess similar, it's also on Azure that there are more than 100, 150 services that you can explore. So with this, Shevin, thank you so much for this little chit chat. So stay tuned, guys. Exactly, stay tuned.